Hello, my name's Julie McCrossan and we're in an Australian backyard so you'll hear birds and dogs and goodness knows what else. I am a survivor of head and neck cancer. In 2013, I was treated for stage four oropharyngeal, tonsils, tongue and throat, oropharyngeal cancer that was caused by the HPV virus, human papillomavirus. And here I am over seven years later. I've been involved in a range of projects with a whole lot of different clinicians, research, advocacy and education. And I think the best way to discuss the benefits of involving patients is to meet fellow clinicians and hear their thoughts and also to see some examples of our work. So you're going to see myself and also my fellow survivor, Hans Eid. You'll see some examples of our work and then I'll be back at the end to tell you the benefits that I've gained as a patient from being involved in research. See you soon. Hello, my name is Phyllis Buto and I work on a research project called Remove the Mask, which is attempting to develop some technology to allow people with head and neck cancer who have to undergo radiotherapy not to wear a mask that fixes their head in place. Uh, this project is being conducted at the University of Sydney uh, by a team of researchers in collaboration with two consumers, Julie McCrossan and Hans Eid. And today I want to talk about the contribution that Julie and Hans make to the project. Firstly, um, they just bring enormous enthusiasm to the project because they've lived through this experience, they've been under the mask and they know how difficult it is. And they remind us all the time about the importance of this to everybody with head and neck cancer, uh, which just increases our motivation to make sure this project is conducted efficiently and successfully. Secondly, uh, they both have huge networks in the head and neck community, both within health, with health professionals and other um, people who have head and neck cancer. And they bring a, an enormous amount of energy to disseminating information about the project and eventually the results. Essentially, they're leading the um, implementation or, or translation of this um, research into clinical practice. Thirdly, uh, Hans and Julie bring questions and perspectives that just may not occur to us as researchers. And each time they ask a question like that, it makes us rethink some aspect of the project and potentially change it and, and change the direction slightly. So um, their perspective um, is critical in the project. And lastly, um, it's just been wonderful get to, to get to know both of them. They're both... Um, very alive, positive people who want to make a contribution to the world and it's just been a privilege to get to know them. Thank you. So my name is Julian McCrossan and uh, I'm a, a former radio broadcaster and television presenter with the ABC and Network 10 and a, a print journalist. Just over five years ago I got the diagnosis of stage four cancer in my tonsils, tongue and throat. I'm alive, for over five years later, I can speak and I can swallow. I am pro-radiation therapy. But what I found really traumatic was the immobilization mask, as they're called. I prefer to call them a safety mask. I can remember vividly the first time that I was clicked down firmly in the big green mask because I immediately panicked. I felt my heart rate go force 10, I went red in the face and water, sweat started pouring off me. And I immediately said to the radiation therapist who'd clicked me down, please take it off, please take it off. To their credit, they whipped it off me. But I remembered that there were about 25 people waiting outside. I remembered that my um, surgeon had told me I was not eligible for surgery. I had to cope with radiation. So I literally thought, suck it up. And I said, put it back on. But it was just a desperately difficult and panic-stricken experience. And to panic for 20 minutes uh, is a really remarkable thing. But if it is possible through research to find an alternative to the mask, to remove the mask and keep us safe, I, I would love to live long enough to see that happen.
Oh. <laughs> I'm Han Seed. I'm uh, 64 years old and uh, living down in Camden. And, um, and this is Sizzle. <laughs> uh, I was diagnosed for cancer in uh, 2011. When they told me that I had to have an operation and uh, then after that radiation. So the first thing was to make the mask, the dreaded mask, like one of them. And when the treatment started and they asked, do you want to have uh, uh, something for it to calm your nerves and things? And of course, being a man, you say, ah, I'll be right. But I knew I wouldn't be 100% right because I'm claustrophobic. So 25 to 30 minutes that you're strapped up and you can't move. It was horrendous. It, it, it was dreadful, but um, I can take a lot of things. I just learned to have happy thoughts and to try to be not there, to, to be somewhere else and get over with it. And after that, I recovered and um, I wasn't a nervous wreck. That's not the right thing to say. But I felt very uncomfortable to be in confined spaces after that as well. And then um, recovered and went back to work and life was pretty good again. Two years later, the cancer came back on the other side of my neck. So we had to do it all over again. I would have been in for a couple of minutes and I was waving my arms madly. I said, I can't do this and I come back out again. So then they had to give me a sedation and um, had to wait them half an hour for that to take place and things and try it again. So um, that, that was pretty traumatic. But uh, then I heard that a lot of people need to be sedated every time. Two out of almost 60 treatments, I freaked out. But I did it. And uh, I'm pleased that I did. I've been cancer free for five and a half years now. So in my book, I'm cured. <laughs> well, there's actually surprisingly little research on this topic, given the impact it has on people like you and Hans. Um, and in fact, Australia has punched above its weight in this area, and a lot of research has come out of New South Wales and Queensland, in fact. And what that research tells us is that, you know, I think, as you said before, there isn't anybody who doesn't come into this new situation with some trepidation and fear, and it is a scary situation to be in. But many people do cope with the mask, but the research suggests about, that about a quarter of patients who are um, having radiotherapy with the mask struggle. And about six in 100 people really struggle to the point where they're having panic attacks and the treatment has to be stopped. Uh, so that's not an insignificant number of people who struggle with this. Well, really, the, the genesis of the Remove the Mask project was when you were at a medical physics conference in Sydney and you were telling us about your experience and you were waving the mask around and how ill-prepared you were from an educational perspective, but also just what a bad experience it was for you. And I was there sitting in the audience saying, actually, we have the technology. If we combine three separate technologies and bring them together, we should be able to, with a lot of effort and a big team, remove the mask and make treatment effective and safe for head and neck cancer patients without the mask. And we're a team of amazingly dedicated, passionate, predominantly young physicists, engineers, computer scientists, who've got a, a common vision to improve how we can image and target cancer. And we work very closely with cl clinicians who are very engaged and wanting to have technology to improve the treatment for their patients. And a couple of examples that we've taken from the sort of discovery and you know, innovation all the way through to clinical trials are the ability to find the cancer during treatment in the prostate and liver for patients, and then also to be able to, to move the, the radiation beam so it follows the cancer within the body. And these are technologies, again, going from the, the bench to the bedside. Um, another 
technology we've had for developed for imaging lungs is now available worldwide. So we've, we've done this before and we think we can do it again. All research takes money and as I understand it, you have received some funding for Remove the Mask, at least to begin it, from Cancer Australia. Can you explain what is Cancer Australia and what money have you received? What are you expected to do with those funds? Sure. So actually our first initial funding came from a crowdfunding campaign and the, the level of engagement we've had from patients and clinicians has been really heartwarming and encouraging that people see this as a real problem. And we, did, we have got funding from uh, Cancer Australia who provide uh, funding but also advice for cancer patients across, across Australia. And they've funded the Remove the Mask project for three years to allow us to really combine these three technologies of monitoring the patient's surface, combining the surface imaging with, with x-rays so we can sort of see inside the patient, and then adjusting the radiation beam. And these are all very complex technologies. And we also need to not do these solutions in isolation. We need to do solutions that are acceptable for the patients and also acceptable to the doctors as well. So it's very much a lot of things coming together and working on this common problem to remove the safety mask. I'm Sandra Turner, I'm a radiation oncologist in Sydney and I've had the great fortune to work with Julie on multiple projects now, particularly relating to advocacy and education and, and research projects. The monumental way that uh, this partnership has changed my thinking is, is hard to summarise. But just to pick out a few highlights, I think working so closely with a patient uh, really helps you to understand what is important to patients and to make sure that we're asking the relevant questions, that we're answering the relevant answers. It's also helped me to really keep focus on the interdisciplinary nature of what we do and the importance of all the skills and value in terms of patient care that all our different professionals and allied health people bring to any project uh, that we might we might conduct. I think being able to use uh, Julie's or, or benefit from Julie's huge uh, networks that we wouldn't have access to both in terms of helping recruitment to trials, uh, helping make sure that trial questions are relevant, uh, and also access to large social media networks is something that we, we should all be, be bearing in mind. Perhaps most interesting for me and most fun is the cre creativity that it brings to work with somebody like Julie that's, that's out of our professional um, sphere. It really makes you think out of the box and not be constrained by our uh, dogmas and rules and, and um, categories that we tend to think within as, as health professionals. Oh, look, there's so much more, but um, I'll le leave it at that. And uh, thanks, Julie, for, for asking me to be involved with this project. Okay, ready? That's not a Linac. This is a Linac. Hello, I'm Julie. Radiation therapy cures cancer. I know because five years ago I had stage four cancer in my tonsils, the back of my tongue and the side of my throat. And after radiation therapy and a team, <laughs> it's all gone. We're working together in targeting cancer to spread the word to patients and family doctors that radiation therapy is now more effective with fewer side effects and more precise than ever before. So if you or a loved one have cancer, you must ask your doctor, is radiation therapy an option for you? Because radiation therapy cures cancer, it cured mine. Julie McCrossan and I'm at St James Hospital in Leeds and this 
is an absolutely accurate baby Lenac. This is a radiotherapy machine and it's designed for young people, but some adult patients see it as well, to show them what to expect when they're going to have radiation treatment. I'm holding Ken, who's got a little clear Perspex mask but I was a head and neck cancer patient in 2013 and I used the kind of mask that Barbie is wearing right now. And the purpose of these masks for head and neck cancer patients is to hold you completely still so that the radiation beam can be very accurate in taking out the cancer but not hitting organs or bones or tissue that is healthy because you don't want to kill or damage that. And I found using this mask as an adult very, very difficult. And I'm just thrilled to be here in Leeds in the United Kingdom where some very creative people who are all standing around listening to me make this, these remarks created this wonderful working model uh, to explain to children and to some adult patients the experience that they're about to have in order to introduce it in a less threatening way uh, than going into a big room where everything is life-size. And I'm very much hoping that we can have something like this in every cancer treatment room in Australia and New Zealand. So thanks for watching. So this is a rigid plastic mask. There is some movement in it for patients and it does have cut out around the mouth. Um, it is obviously designed that patients can see through it and they can breathe through it but it does keep them very still. And so we deal with millimetre accuracy. If the patient is a, a millimetre different to the, the, the position the treatment was planned in, then the bed needs to move that millimetre. Um, and we can't get that accuracy without some degree of immobilisation. So I know, Julie, you like to call this the safety mask, and, and that's what it really is. It's about protecting the areas that are really important, protecting the eyes and those salivary glands, but at the same time, making sure that we don't miss that tumour. This mask is made, um, it, it's heated up and pulled over the patient. We recognise it's really difficult for some patients and we have to provide them lots of support. I certainly now never, never get a patient to agree to radiotherapy or talk to them about radiotherapy without showing them one of these things. And then there are some very useful videos like on the Targeting Cancer website that you've done, Julie, to help um, educate patients so they aren't surprised when they turn up on day one what this is about. Well, maybe I'll start by telling you about this machine, Julie. So this is a linear accelerator or a LINAC, and this is the, the radiation treatment machine. So the powerful X-rays come out of, out of here and, um, and then go into the patient. This machine, the, the X-rays are just like X-rays that people have for when they're having a chest X-ray or a CT scan, except they're more powerful. They don't feel anything while they're having them. Um, and then whilst the X-rays are coming out of here, the machine is rotating round. And that allows us to very accurately deliver dose, the high dose to the area that needs to be delivered. That's the tumour. Um, and to provide or, or to ensure that there's a much lower dose to the surrounding areas. And that's really the thing that over the past decade and a half has changed a lot in radiation therapy, where we can avoid those very important structures that are so important for function that aren't involved by the cancer. We want to keep the dose as low as possible. To work well with a head and neck cancer patient who has to manage this experience of wearing the mask, you try to develop some kind of relationship with them? You absolutely do. You need to have a real understanding of the patient because no two patients are the same. So you really need to spend the time with them to understand what it is they need, have a discussion and even set the expectation early. Why is the expectation important? It gives the patient a bit more control. It allows them to really understand what is to come and know that there are options. Being in that room on your own is very terrifying, so we understand that you need some guidance and we are here to do anything that we can to make it as easy as, as possible. And do you think there's a place for models and pictures as a way of showing the patient what's going to happen? In our day and age, I think the more pictures, the more videos and models, the more information the patient gets prior to coming in, the easier it will be once they're here. Why? 
it gives them information it gives them ability to ask questions it gives them a source just to look back to and even show their relatives so that their relatives understand what they're going through and share that with the family and friends welcome to the head and neck cancer 2020 video series Presented by St Vincent's Hospital Sydney, the Kinghorn Cancer Centre and St Vincent's Private Hospital Sydney. Well, look, I'm a, a, a former head and neck cancer patient and I very much wanted to have a, 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 a forum, a public forum that had both members of multidisciplinary teams and head and neck cancer patients and their families all together uh, talking about improvements in treatment to improve survival and quality of life. And, and what was critical about this idea was that both the clinicians and the patients and family were all together because I'd seen that done with prostate cancer patients and breast cancer patients. And I thought, wow, it, it's so much more powerful if everybody's together. And we organised this fantastic forum that was due to happen in June. And then COVID-19 came along. and. I knew it was going to be at least a couple of years before we could gather together in a room. So I, I went to Associate Professor Richard Gallagher, who was my surgeon, and uh, Dion Forstner, who's head of radiation at St Vincent's uh, Hospital Sydney, and I said, instead, let's not waste all this work, let's uh, do a series of video interviews. So what we've I really wanted to do was to capture really useful information to raise awareness of just how tough head and neck cancer treatment is, how important teamwork is during and after treatment to give us a chance to survive and thrive. Head and neck cancer, treatment innovations, improving survival and quality of life. Providing up-to-date, evidence-based information for everyone in the head and neck cancer community. Presented by Julie McCrossan a head and neck cancer survivor. Media production by Daniel Taylor at Inside IT. Well, thank you so much to everybody who's been involved in those snippets of activities that you've just seen. And most recently in the Head and Neck Cancer 2020 video series uh, made by Daniel Taylor. And he's also made this contribution to the Estro 2020. I think the key message I want you to take away from this is that get active, form relationships with patients, form relationships with fellow multidisciplinary clinicians and do practical things. Yes, apply for funds for research and I'm very happy to be part of those applications. I know that patients are required by many funders now, but I want you to be more proactive than that. I want you to really get to know patients develop relationships and common goals and help to raise awareness and money so that the research can take place. Most of all, I'd love you to subscribe to the Head and Neck Cancer 2020 video series and we'll put information up on the screen and have a look at interviews with 15 different clinicians, allied health, nurses and doctors, just as an example of what can be done with patients when you truly collaborate. But most importantly, I want to thank Associate Professor Richard Gallagher, my ENT surgeon, the man who uh, diagnosed me and did the biopsy, and then handed me over to Associate Professor Dion Forstner, radiation oncologist, because radiation was best for me. How remarkable that a surgeon, when I go to him, will give me his reputation, he'll help me find funds, and help me film videos in operating theatres, in bunkers and all over the place to support a patient idea as a true partner. And now we're helping each other to promote it. So thank you very much uh, for watching this and I look forward to seeing what you do with the patients and multidisciplinary team members in your life. Thank you very much, Estro 2020.